Hello again, I'm Awak. I'm Gamadev. And welcome back to our Let's Play video blogcast thing, or at least so-called, until we can come up with a better name with it. And we are continuing our sojourn through Monster Manor, uh, going through Map 3, maybe Map 4, we'll see. Um, so last time I called attention to uh, this screen coming up, that one right there, and we'll get to that eventually. And uh, we got the logo as well. Still no tearing. I'll explain that in a bit, and um, we're gonna we're gonna talk about the opening uh, credits here with uh, Les Hedger. So as you know, Les Hedger uh, uh, did uh, did the overview for this, and uh, Bob Vieira wrote the script. But uh, Kim Tempest did most of the uh, artwork on this, and this so the little smoke that you see coming in here. Um, so the people uh, in uh, Studio 3DO uh, said, oh my god, you used like digital smoke or something? And she said, no, I just put dry ice fog over a black canvas <laughs> and then matted it in. With... So they, were all, yeah. they were all like, ah, oh, that's, so, that's so amazingly clever. And it's like, not really. It's fairly obvious, in fact. But I thought that was hilarious. And they just like immediately assumed it was some like fancy uh, Adobe Premiere plugin. And she spent like a week rendering with some procedural smoke or yeah, exactly. paid for an effects library where it's like, no, no, just yeah. go to the store, $2 worth of dry ice, you're done. Yeah, a piece of black cloth. Um, I don't remember the gentleman who uh, put this together, this particular model and animation, but I believe he did it in 3D Studio because there was nothing on the Mac that would do this. And again, the Amigo wasn't quite up to this to this level at that time. Uh, and I remember seeing the model on a, on a giant PC screen. It was like all of 1024 by 768. Oh, wow. Uh, well, a and, decked out Amiga would have been okay for this. Uh, maybe. I mean, they were doing Babylon 5 on the Amiga at this time, so. Yeah, yeah but they, they had like a stack of Amigas doing yes, it. Yes, yes. You had to do this like probably in a week or something. And, right. Uh, and, you know, back then, your average computer was, you know, ten times slower than my wristwatch is right now, so... <laughs> yeah, you, of course, have memory. an Android wrist, wristwatch. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I think, um... I can't remember... We did this really quickly, too. I think this was, like, done in a total of two weeks. We checked the models out, and we did pencil tests and ran through it. We said, yeah, that looks good. Um, and... So, put that. so the EA logo not tearing. What's the deal oh, about what's that? that about that? Okay, we'll just hang here on the option screen while I explain that. Okay, so 3DO provided code to do video streaming. Uh, there's it was like Lib 3DO or something was called like that, and it was this Quick Time. I actually I never looked at Quick Time, so I don't know if it actually resembled Quick Time. But they had it was a fairly obtuse set of code where you had to like register subscribers for chunk types and they would get triggered and I don't know how they handled um, uh, what was it uh, how they handled synchronization or anything like that but so it was basically a blob of code and you just linked it into your program and pointed it at a file and it would do everything else and when I first ran it against the the assets that we created I saw this tear in the middle of the screen this like you know half of one frame and half of the next frame was being displayed at the same time and I went what's going on here and so I find and I got and I saw that all the other titles that were under development at that time were doing it too and I'm going what's going on here and so I looked at the code and discovered that they were rendering the Cinepak decoder was decompressing to the front buffer hmm. just decompressing to the visible buffer and I'm going what the hell are you doing why did you do that and I looked at this and I didn't know enough about Cinepak to know if if every if it was every frame was a complete frame or whether they were doing deltas on the previous frame they were applying yeah know, they um, had to do some deltas to get right so so apparently they didn't do a double buffer delta where they do apply deltas to two frames back they d applied it to one frame back so i couldn't just simply double buffer in the ordinary manner so i said i don't like this i, I wanted to see if i could do something about this turns out there's this wonderful feature in the 3do uh, that's part of the video RAMs. And as you probably know, video RAMs are dual ported. There's one port, which is address and data pins, and then there's the other port, which is the serial port, which marches pixels out to the DACs, mm -hmm. to the video DACs. Right. Okay. And that serial port is two kilobytes in size. And when it runs out, it just like loads another 2K byte page and keeps shifting it out. 
During vertical blank, however, it's not doing anything because there's no information. The, the, the right. video beam is retracing. So during vertical blank, you can do other stuff with that 2K buffer. And it turns out that it can load an entire 2K byte page like in one clock. It's incredibly fast to, to load 2K bytes. And then you can write that 2K byte page, that 2K byte shift register, to any other 2K byte page in video RAM right. just as fast. So you can copy the entire display in like a video line. That's very good. Which is, yeah, I mean, it's faster than the cell engine can do it, faster than the CPU could do it. So what I did was I went into the main loop in the rendering loop and I said, okay, render to the back buffer and then during vertical blank, use the video RAM serial port to copy to the front buffer. The result is no tearing. And I think I'm the only one who did that because if you look at all the other games that came out during that time, you know, like from EA and everything, you'll see that tear in the middle of the screen. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's... <laughs> well, you know, well, I mean, the whole thing about, you know, not tearing and running in the back buffer and all that stuff, that's that's a little bit of experience from uh, animators, Disney Animator? Um, yeah, a little bit of that. Um, the Disney Animation Studio, which I also wrote for the Amiga, not to toot my own horn. Yes. But, uh, but yeah, a lot, of, a, lot of ex a lot of stuff that I learned on the Amiga I, pull, I brought forward to the 3DO. So let's load that game. All right. Did save it? Oh, that's good. Yeah, we remember it was just like I discovered we did lowercase. Yes, so. yes, the old 3DO didn't have to buy memory cards because it had built-in NVRAM. Yeah, probably flat. the last console to ever do that. How much did we have? 64K bytes? Right. That was like 32K. Ah. Which, you know, you can get a lot of games in. Get games in this day, the save state was actually pretty small. The largest I think I've ever seen was 6K. Hmm. And if you have something like Game Guru, you can compress them usually and make them even smaller. But, um, this is, I think, the level that people were complaining about the music. Yes. So. Uh, it's Well, the thing is, like, it's actually good music. Mm -hmm. And it's very repetitive, though, is the main problem. Ah. And this is actually, this level is the one where everybody goes, ah, the Haunted Mansion. Uh -huh. Between Les's voice ah, okay. and the, the little statues you get here, this is, like, straight out of the old yeah, yeah. Haunted Mansion <laughs> <laughs> and the wallpaper and all that stuff. It, it, this is like the most fun level before it starts getting really creepy in terms mm -hmm. of like the music and everything. Oh, there's the ghost. Yes. I, I refer to that as the opera ghost because you know, it does that scream, that wonderful, you know, ah, scream. <laughs> Very melodramatic scream. That she... um, internally in the program, his name is George. George. Ah. Don't know why. It's, yes. it's, his name is George. So all these uh, ghosts and stuff are actually, they're stop motion, right? Yes, they're stop motion animated. Um, Kim Tempest did uh, most of the work on this. I think they were, uh, most of them were like claymation models or like armatures that she put together. Yes, I know they're here because I played this a little earlier. Uh, okay, this, actually, let me kill this guy, these guys over here. Yeah, these are the ones that I always like. If you not don't check the corners, tends to it will come up behind you right. and like ah, oh, what the hell? Stab you in the back. And quite quite spooky when you play this in a dark room uh, late at night. <laughs> so the the artists asked me for animated textures, and I went oh god, you know, because we had like a really short time to do all this. Oh, you really want animated textures? Why do you want animated textures? Oh, we want to do stuff. Oh, fine. So I gave them animated textures and. This was the first thing. Oh, extra! <laughs> did you hear a yippee? Yeah, I heard yeah that. That's that's the sound it makes when you get an extra man. This is the first thing they did with uh, the animated textures, and I went, oh, okay, that was worth the trouble. And I th I forget who did this. Was it Liz? It might have been Liz Beatrice who did that, but that's just great. So that made. Oh, hi there. Do I have another one well, over gotta, here? You got to have you know. Flickering candle flames and stuff. Uh, if you ever lighted torches along the wall, of course, this is a house, so I guess you get mm -hmm. like a broken bulb or something. Yeah, it was mostly torchlight. Um, during the catacombs levels, which come up later, um, that's used to uh, much much greater effect. Uh, flickering torchlight on the walls. Anyone over there? Okay. So if I remember correctly, yeah. Kill them quickly. 
Like I said, I, when I saw this and I thought, oh, you know, those guys look, the monsters look really great compared to, like, say, what you see in Doom, which are just obviously hand drawn sprites. Mm. Uh, Castle Wolfstein, where it's like, you know, whereas these, you know, that, they look like they were expensively rendered, but I'm guessing they were actually, you know, just. They were, yeah, they were stop frame animated. Oh, poor Kim. Um, we, she used 3D Animator to do a lot of the. She would, first of all, she had, like, a video camera or. Some, I can't figure out what kind of camera she used. Uh, might have been a... Because digital cameras really didn't exist back then. Got the key. Um, and so she took uh, frames... She took still frames of this, but 3 do Animator was so unbelievably unreliable that you basically had to do, like, edit pixel... Oh, we're back in the main room. Edit a pixel, save. Edit another pixel, save. And if you didn't do that, you were at risk of losing your work. So, oh, I'm out of keys. Ah. Great. All right. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. weird. Could, could, have, could have sworn I picked up. All right. Let's go over here. Yeah, a lot of the wall, a lot of the wall art was done by uh, Liz Beatrice, Greg Savoya. I think Stefan contributed to this as well. Going in here. This was another. This is another issue with some of the, the maps that. Uh, nope. So, that so. the Stefan was, like. There's this one map coming up. I think it's map ten, where the um, the key budget is really really tight, and if you get it wrong, you'll end up with no keys and doors yet to open. Hmm, did I miss something over here? Nope. Nope. So what? I just ran out. Oh, that's right. You can't say you can only save at the ah. end of a level, right? You can't. That's correct. So there's, there's no, there's no. In so yeah, see, kids in the in the old days, yeah. games were tough. You actually had to <laughs> complete a level. Now there's, ah, I'll pick this up and do something dangerous, uh, but I can always go back to my last save. No, right. Yeah. No. 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 No checkpoints. No nothing. Bas the level was basically the checkpoint, and then mm -hmm. you had the option to save there because yeah. Well, part of the reason, I mean, we could have done. We now call this night. You call basically this idea like sort of like nightmare mode on a regular PC game where it's like, oh, you can't save except it. You know, very well defined blocks of time. So. Well, part part of that is. I, I considered whether to um, save in you know, you know mid-level saves, right. and I decided not to because that would require storing the state of every right. monster. Right. Ooh. Well, you could just, you could break it down to a bit thing of like, are they dead or not? Essentially, you know. Right. But, but uh, yeah, it would be you know relatively large uh, save mm -hmm. game, uh, and plus it's sort of like you know, do you really need? Yeah, you know, it allows people to kind of yeah. yeah I won't say cheat, but it's like makes the game way easier than it would normally be. They can just like you know clear out a large section, save, clear out a large section, save. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, as if they were using 3D Animator, right? <laughs> <laughs> open door, save. Open yeah. Doors. <laughs> yeah, that that's uh, yeah. 3D Animator was like this big monolithic program, wasn't it? For, yes, uh, it was. It was yeah. basically a kludge yeah, of studio. Studio 32 from Electronic Arts, because Electronic Arts was our um, tool vendor, so to speak, um, and that was a consequence of the fact that 3D 3DO was founded by uh, Trip Hawkins, and so he, before he officially separated from Electronic Arts, uh, he simply said, "Hey, um, let's help these guys out." There we go. Is that the only one on this wall? Yes. Yeah, that was the era of like monolithic programs or whatever. It was sort of like, you know, let's do, let's integrate everything into one package, which for game developers is probably not a good idea. No. Batch process, because when you're doing game art assets, if you can't batch process, if you have to like literally go into a, a, a program like say, well, today would be something like Photoshop, open a single file, do something to it, close it, save mm -hmm. it, do it again. Yeah, that gets really old real fast. You need to be able to like batch convert stuff, um, yeah. pipelines, and it's like it was, there, there was that weird time there when they thought it was like, hey, we don't need programmers anymore to make games. <laughs> Just have a bunch of scripts. Artists can do it. It was around the 
around the time of mist, where suddenly somebody got the idea. It's like, hey, artists can just by themselves make something with this visual scripting hyper stack thingy or something. Yeah, card hype. And then you know that quickly died because once you got a zillion mist clones, and then realized, yeah, you kind of need engineers for things like gameplay. But also the whole thing was like the development environment was going to be this like nice, friendly, gooey, point and clicky, macky thing, and then right. yeah, and then that's been a holy grail for decades now. And it's, yeah, every every year somebody comes up with the you know look, you could just point and click and look, make your game. And it's like there's there is not a button, there's not a make game button anywhere. Or, no, no, you know, not going to be. It's, Every now and then somebody will say it's like, you know, we really need to increase the fun of this section. I'll just say it's like, well, let me let me just get to the fun slider. Uh, <laughs> crank it up. And it's like, oh, sorry, fun buffer overflow. We can't, <laughs> can't crank it up that high. <laughs> so, yeah. You still need engineers. Even, even if you're using, like, a pre-built engine, you still end up yeah, needing please. engineers unless you're doing something that's literally just like a... Yeah, please. A mod where you're just changing out the models and the, and the you know just skinning the game essentially. It's uh, but yeah, I, I remember when we got around to doing M2, mm -hmm. they they realized kind of the folly of the whole like like, like let's everything go through this one very fragile Mac package, <laughs> and so we went to more traditional, which we still use this very day, you know, batch processing tools where it's like okay. Have a tool that takes in a common format that every art program in the world can output mm -hmm. and have it convert to your custom format and do it quickly and do it in batches and make it very flexible and port that tool to every platform on the planet. So if your developers are using expensive SGI workstations, they can run your, your batch script. If they're mm -hmm. running on Macs, they can run your Mac batch script. If they're running on Linux workstations, or well, that time it wasn't Linux, it was... Linux you, you, just showed just up. Just showed up, yeah. It was generic Unix stations or if they're running PCs, they can, yeah, you know. Sun workstations, yeah. They can run, you know, your batch script and chain them together in a nice, efficient way and as quickly as possible get something up and running, you know. Because most developers usually are not making, are not going to devote their entire life to your custom development chain. You know? mm -hmm. They're probably making for multiple platforms and yeah, a lot of ghosts in there. And nicely transparent, too. You yeah. see right through them. Yep. So I think you had to sort those little buggers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's one of the things that killed me on the, the progenitor of this. That I might have, I mentioned in the last episode that the, uh, the project that got aborted to, to make this was the sorting problem. Um, and that's why this engine was so much easier to make because a giant cube map is trivially sortable. Yes. Um, well, that, it's interesting you bring that up with sorting, because another first-person game on the 3DO, uh, PO'd. Yes. Which is a full 3D engine. Right. Those guys, when they went to do it on the PlayStation, uh -huh. found, like they said, you know, the PlayStation is faster at raw math, mm -hmm. um, but it was slower than certain things on the 3DO. Um, it's rasterized really slower, had less flexible format. But the thing that actually was killing them performance-wise was sorting. Mm -hmm. And... So what they figured, so something they figured out on the 3DO that they could do, was the uh, the cell engine. They figured out a, a nifty way of uh, very quickly, basically for free, uh, bucket sorting with the cell engine. So I'm not referring to a PlayStation 3 cell engine. I'm referring to the uh, the, the uh, graphics chip on mm -hmm. the the 3DO, where they basically created a whole bunch of um, cell entries. Mm -hmm. And then use like the they use 16-bit depth. They looked at the first eight bits yeah, and right. they would write it out to. Uh, they had, uh, I think, 256 bogus uh, cell entries, mm -hmm. and then they just added to the, each of those, and then they'd walk the list again using the lower eight bits. I think it's like they did the lower first and then they did the upper next, hmm. and they'd write that out to another list, and then boom, it's sorted by the cell engine as it's traversing. The list. They'd figured out, they said basically it's free bucket sorting for you know, arbitrary bucket sorting. And something they said, you know, that it like basically made up the difference in terms huh. of the processing power because the, the PS3 had to do that on the CPU. Yeah. And that was actually a, a slow process. Right. And 
Whereas like the 3DO was free. So like the transform stuff that was way faster on the PS3 mm -hmm. was slower on the 3DO. So it's sort of like they sort of evened each other out. You know, huh. the, little, the sorting trick that they figured out. And it was like, oh, when I, I saw it, I was like, oh yeah, that totally would work. It was very clever. So you see just taking their 16-bit number, looking at 8 bits at a time of it, mm -hmm. and using just... Uh, the, the cell engine's natural ability to like change, uh, I guess it's a linked list of cells. Yes. To just cr automatically create a final linked list just by walk by traversing the cells. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, the cells. You said to incur the memory cost of the like five hundred and twelve entries. Yeah. Right. Basically, yeah. This, the uh, the three D O cell engine had a um, basically a thirty two bit pointer that pointed to the next cell to be rendered. So you would pass the hardware a pointer to a cell. And then it would follow the chain until it found an entry with the um, the last bit set, right. as it was called. And then it would stop. Right. And so, like programming all this stuff together was just like cake. Yeah. Uh, and CPU addresses were the same as hardware addresses, so it was just you know, almost yeah. embarrassingly easy to to, yeah. uh, to put together a, a fairly complex uh, yeah. bit of rendering. Yeah. And I read that I was like I was kind of sad because it's like if more developers had learn stuff like that mm -hmm. I think uh, the 3DO might have had a longer life than it did I, I wish I'd known that because I saw <laughs> I saw PO'd and I said that's pretty much what I wanted to do it's very similar to what yeah. I wanted to do yeah. Yikes. It, oh, it, that actually is that coming at me yeah. <laughs> yep <laughs> <laughs> now you know gotcha as, as somebody's working on a not a first person, but a third person game like that. Mm -hmm. First thing I mean to say is like, wow, I wish you'd put a sound effect on that thing. Is it whizzed by? <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of a whooshing noise. Because we, uh, it's like that would that would really sell it, you know. <laughs> ah, yeah, it's. Uh, but I mean, yeah, for something. For a launch title, this is launch window title. I guess. Yes, uh, this is this is quite impressive. This uh, kept me busy many a many a night, <laughs> and yeah, oh, the production value is you know for it's, it's a relatively small team of people worked yeah. on this. About um, well, there was me. There was John Loop doing programming. We had um, one other gentleman uh, who helped with the sound because the sound. Hello there. The sound was actually kind of complicated from my point of view. Because it was a, a DSP sort of plug board sort of affair, uh, where you created these DSP elements and then wired them all up in software. Which was, yeah, itself way ahead of its time. Yeah. Yes. Um, but I didn't quite grasp that. And so uh, another fella came in and, and wrote most of that code so that I could just say, um, play this sound effect. You know, like, ding, ding, all those. Yeah. And then, he, and then the streaming in the background, that's actually an AIFF file pe playing off the CD. Yeah, the uh, yeah the sound chip, sound hardware in the 3 do was actually very sophisticated. I don't think of like all the the three consoles at the time. I think it was probably the best sound in terms of hardware mm -hmm. complexity. Mm -hmm. Saturn might have been pretty good as well, um, but it's like I mean I developed on the PlayStation 2, and I don't think it probably had as capable sound hardware as the 3 do did. I mean, because the PlayStation, well, the PlayStation basically had uh, Super Nintendo sound hardware in it, because it started life as a, as basically the CD-ROM adapter for the the Super Nintendo. I mean, that's oh, that I hadn't. Heard. Oh, well, yeah, that's that's a very pretty famous story about. Uh, they were basically going to be like what the Sega CD was. Sony was making the CD drive for the Super Nintendo. Uh. Then it. It was like CES or something. Nintendo, unbeknownst to Sony, announced that their partner for that would be Philips, not Sony. No. Oh. Sony, being you know Sony. Japanese, yeah. um, <laughs> said you have dishonored that, us. Basically, yes. Yeah, so they said I don't care what it costs. We're going to make our own game console using this technology, and we're going to bankrupt you. <laughs> this was full on revenge mode out of Sony. Because uh, otherwise, okay. Sony, you know, why would we bother getting to that market? It's silly. You know? And and when Sony announced that they were getting into that. Oh, we, I mean, I scoffed because you know they'd never done it before. Yeah, I thought, yeah. What, do they, what do you think you're doing? Yeah, they, they, yeah, you know, their inexperience actually was probably like their best uh, thing going for them, and the fact they were doing it sort of out of blind rage. Um, so, <laughs> because they, their hardware is very simple. 
it's what, you know PS3 a PS2 no PS it's PS PlayStation yeah wow. it's basically it's Where a bunch of very off the shelf chips kind of thrown together mm -hmm. like they said a Super Nintendo sound hardware you know because that's what they knew how to use and they knew it was I think it's like an in Sonic sound chips like same mm -hmm. thing like the Apple II GS or very sim same family mm -hmm. um, Apple II G Wiz yeah um, but you know it was just like okay what what's a fast processor we can throw in here boom we got it so it it wasn't a very deep console but it's very simple mm -hmm. and it's sort of like here's a hardware manual guys go at it and that appealed a lot to developers yes. who were used to doing that we for other hardware, platforms hardware banging and yeah yeah and so that worked to their advantage you know when the PlayStation mm -hmm. 2 came around it kind of didn't as much but they had so much momentum mm -hmm. it worked out for them um, because because people like you know blown off the Dreamcast and they got the PlayStation Two and they're like oh wow we're stuck with this um, <laughs> we've already kind of <laughs> fought, passed on the Dreamcast and so we're kind of stuck with this hardware which wasn't as clean as the original PlayStation <laughs> but uh, yeah I mean Sony's uh, you know dead simple approach was you know great for a lot of developers. Yeah. They had a few uncertain months there, but you know, everybody was willing to give them a try because they were, you know, very, they were, you know, cheap relative to like the Saturn, and mm -hmm. their hardware was very straightforward and had a lot of power in certain areas. Ooh, that okay? But yeah, it was. Uh, uh, yeah, I was still. Like I said, I was kind of sad that people never dug deep into the 3DO, like all the little nooks and crannies of what it could do, like they did with like earlier platforms. Yeah. Now, I would have liked to have seen the, the PO code. I mean, that, that sort of depth sorting was exactly the sort of thing that I was trying to yeah, make that, work. That game is very impressive for a couple, couple of reasons. One, it's a full 3D game. Uh, yeah. Unlike Doom, which is... It's, yeah, so Doom is really a 2D as a 2D map. Yes, there you can There's no places that exist height wise in two. You can't exist two places height wise that thing. There's no like under over staircases yeah. in that game. Whereas PO was actually a full 3D game, 3D physics, really good oh, movement. Phys wow, you're out kind of out of. Oh that. no! <laughs> oh, I gotta do it again. Like is, that back to... is that Les's laugh? That's Les. Okay. I was wondering <laughs> oh, if you're no. gonna use RJ's laugh. Uh, <laughs> no. It was later used yeah. in Return Fire or whatever. <laughs> now I gotta do this all over again. Ah, kind of wishing you had the mid-level save now, aren't you? <laughs> oh God, I'm sorry. No, that's <laughs> fine. I mean, it's, but that it wouldn't be a game to, otherwise. It's kind of hard to talk and uh, yeah, multitask. Why you want to drive now? <laughs> uh, well, well, maybe. Well, if you, if you have a story you want to relate and you need me to drive for a while. <laughs> Hoping I, I was hoping I wouldn't die until the next map because that's when the spiders come out. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. And also, since this is the first hard, I think part of the problem with like this is the first hard map, so you hear this music a lot and you uh, hear tread carefully a lot. Yeah. Oh, there's there's a story. Um, there was. This was also during the dawn of everybody getting really pissy about um, copyright. Even little snippets, like uh, rap artists were using oh, vanilla, uh, vanilla Ice and the whole uh, taking stuff from Queen, that kind of thing. Yeah, little little fragments um, being used in uh, in other works. So s the original version of this cut, hello there, had a um, thing had a snippet that says, "Be careful where you tread," but which was from a larger work. Um, and I don't remember what it was from. It was from some other scary record, you know, scary sound effects record. And um, the lawyer said, no, can't use that. So it had to be replaced. It had to be replaced. So this is basically a snippet from uh, Les and during one of the between level things saying, tread carefully now. It's, it's certainly the most memorable sound bite in the game for me uh, he's like Tread well, Guffinite well first, first yeah because he's like saying it a, do a billion times yeah but like I said it's, it just fits exactly. nicely with the level um, mm -hmm. I mean I, Shortcut this is not my favorite piece of music in the level but it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it's not too bad if you get through the level quickly 
<laughs> <laughs> but there's a, like the, I think like the very next piece of music we hear in the game is like one that I actually it's just there's a lot of sound effects on it, mm -hmm. a lot of ambient sound effects, and I will actually use that. Um, back when I used to get trick or treaters at my apartment a lot, huh. I would actually crank up the sound system, put this, basically put the the music for this on really and basically it's like my house my, my heart was suddenly a haunted house that the kids love to trick-or-treat at because because huh. it has like the occasional screams the moans the chain rattling and all that stuff and it's like it's it's oh, like nice. perfect halloween music is on this thing i know people on the internet have ripped all the the audio tracks out of this and oh it turns out that, them online. it turns it turns out that's really easy <laughs> Well, yeah, ripping it's just, the ripping it's just the an original. AIF file, right? Yeah, yeah, it's an AIFF file, but also the file system. Is there a door back here? No, the AIFF the file system basically tries to store data in contiguous blocks. So all you really have to do is find the block that has the AIFC header on it, and AIFC describes its own size. Right. So hey there. So just then slurp up that many blocks. Contiguous blocks off the disk. You've got the whole file. We should, we should one of these. We should play PO some of the later levels. That's, that's a really that's one of those like unsung games on the system. Oh yeah. Because well, I mean, a lot, I've, people, I've like a lot of people level. have played it. But see, that's the problem. Is a lot of people will play the first level and then uh. they'll give up on it. Really? Because it's hard. well, it's not that hard. It's kind of it's it's one of those like you never get a second chance to make a first impression. Oh. And a lot of people are just put off by the frying pan as the weapon. The fact that you oh. have to earn every weapon along the way, mm -hmm. and you start off with well, you know, a frying pan because you're supposed to be a cook. It's kind of got that whole like right. uh, under siege uh, Steven Seagal movie plot thing going. <laughs> uh, but yeah, and they don't like you know it's like you move slow and all that stuff. I and I would kind of agree with them, except I'd played the demo of this. It was like one of those 3DO sampler discs, mm -hmm. and they smartly on that one chose yeah. a later level where you got the jetpack, ah. and you got a whole bunch of weapons. And so I knew the game was going to get better. Ah. And it is actually a great thing in a game where if you know it's going to get better, it's great that they have this wonderful progression of like getting a better and better weapon, and then mm -hmm. you unlock the jetpack, and then so, and that's got by far PO'd all-time best jetpack in a game really in terms of physics which is amazing considering you're doing it on the 3do pad you have to control the thing but it's like you very quickly can learn how to control that and you can be you know elegantly strafing and mm. shooting things and you can control it just perfect and it feels like a jetpack unlike most first person shooters where you have a jetpack where uh -huh. they literally just change your height it's like you have like elevator shoes on or something. It's just like up, up. You're on a crane or something. You're just up and down. You don't feel like you're actually in a jetpack. That one, they really did a great job on the movement physics. Sounds like if you tell um, Yahtzee Kershaw about that, he likes jetpacks. Yeah. But yeah, it's uh, it really is good where it's like you can just do like these precision, like ah, it's gonna hop over there, you know, hit the old jetpack and zip over there, and you feel like you're landing and everything. That. Just as you're walking around, the movement physics are great. Now you don't slide around like you're in a wheelchair, hmm. like in most of these games. Yeah, sorry. Uh, it actually it will tilt the camera ever so slightly. Hmm. If you're, I love when you walk backwards off a ledge. Is if you do that in Doom or something? Yeah. The camera would just flip. You'd see the view just vertically translate up. And right. that one, on PO'd, if you walk backwards off a ledge, ledge, the camera tilts up. Oh, as if you're like Going, you, ah. as you're as you're looking up like the last view like the coyote has, you know, <laughs> as he's falling off a cliff. It's like ah, and it's perfect, you know. It really has great movement physics, and it's one of those like games where it's like it was like a I think I was a first time developer. Who did I believe that. so. I believe it was. I saw like a prototype, and they'd done. I think they'd done a few things on the PC after that, but I don't know like uh, what they. But they were from I think they were from Sun Microsystems, like the guys. Oh, originally? Yes. Oh. If I remember their history, uh, they were like, they worked like in the graphics division or something of Sun, you know. Mm -hmm. I said, hey, we could, we know all about this 3D stuff. Let's yeah. do a first person, a, a full 3D first person shooter. This is before Quake, so. Right. You know. But it's like, yeah, the, the graphics get, uh, after that first level, the graphics get better also the thing is just huge in scope there's these wonderful vertical levels where it's like you you know it's not like 
you're trudging through corridors, suddenly once they get the jetpack, you have these wide open spaces that you're going through, and you have these levels where you've got to basically go up mm -hmm. vertically with your jetpack. You're not like, you know, just trudging along. So it's, it, has, it has a very epic feel to it. Hmm. And, the, and it has some really nice use of, you know, the 3D graphic effects for like, you know, you see like reflections on floors in some areas and stuff. Or, really? Oh, or I don't like, remember seeing that. Very, yeah. It, but it's like in the later levels, and again, it's like they, they should have made a more impressive first level. Mm. I mean, that, that was their downfall in terms of a lot of people just got turned off after the first level. It's like, yeah, this is no fun. And they could have used a, 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 a better art director or an art director, period, because... There yeah, was it, most of the most of, I do remember, what I remember of Piode was that the floors and everything were pretty much like solid color polys, probably to get around uh, texture yeah, distortion more than anything else, um, right? And also help their performance a bit. But they were full 3D polys. That was the thing. So it was, but I mean, oh, you could yeah. just see it's like they had this wonderful engine and this wonderful gameplay, but there's just something about you know. Uh, like their demo, at least they cut this for the de the demo. They had these monsters, which were essentially were walking butts, essentially. Oh, it was like basically oh, a person. I, I think I remember that. Decapitate at the butt level, and their attack was well, a fart, essentially, <laughs> complete with sound effect. Now they didn't they didn't take that out of the final game, but at least they they cut down the fart sound, so it didn't sound so juvenile. Uh -huh. But you can tell these are like kids. Are like, yeah, wouldn't it be cool? <laughs> <laughs> you can almost hear like Beavis and Butthead making the game. <laughs> And so if they just had like somebody a little more seasoned as their art director or something, mm -hmm. they really could have, you know, done a. Uh, I think they could have got you know a huge sales and a lot of recognition out of that game. Sort of like it was, it's a diamond in the rough. You could just kind of mm -hmm. see it there. It's like, you know, like say if they had like say a Kim Tempest or something working on their game with them. Say it's like, yeah guys, that's nice and all, but you know, you might want to class it up just a little bit here. I think there was. Yeah, Stuff left in here, but uh, totally out of. Yes. Gee, do you have to consult the map? <laughs> Is your mutant mapping ability not kicking? In? It's not. I haven't kicked in, but uh, <laughs> but I was able to find my way back here without looking at it. Well, I, you don't want to be like stuck without keys or something. Is I there an indicator? Do I have? Oh yeah. I, See, I was wondering. That's like couldn't have put a little sprite on the gun. Like how many keys you have? Um, with your HUD there. Well, uh, we're, the we might have done. I don't know how well how good it would look. We only have three twenty by two forty pixels, and then it's getting mished through NTSC. Yeah. So I, I get it, but you know, yeah, get it in you know, a little little square or something. Not maybe the number of keys, but some little pips or something. Yeah, On the gun there, you have some little red dots there. That I think that things. might have been the part of the, like an original plan, but like I mean, my my favorite like I mean. HUD or no HUD is always like a big uh, issue uh, on mm -hmm. games nowadays. Nowadays, it's like if you can go HUDless, it's considered you know, innovative and immersive. Um, ah, okay, yes. But you still have a HUD. You just have to figure out maybe make it seem organic to the environment, like mm -hmm. you know, say hologram on your weapon or something that shows you the counter of the ammo instead of something that's plastered on your screen. Right. Um, Oh, I know, but of course, I know. it's like, yeah, just assume everybody has those Google glasses in the future. That it makes, you know, in the future, you'll have a HUD, any, you'll have yes. a HUD in real life anyway, so Definitely. what's real life? Yeah. But, uh, no, but I was thinking, like, my favorite, like, Definitely. example of, like, in-game HUD that wasn't really Oops. intentional was, like, Shockwave. The opening, when you're going down to the planet, yeah. and the canopy is closed... Mm -hmm. But you're getting videos. Basically, the there's like a whole bunch of like little red indicators on the thing there, and what it is is actually the streaming. It's telling you, like, it's basically telling the programmers like how full the buffers are. Oh, the streaming buffers. And I thought, oh, that's a great way of doing it without having to incur like a, you know basically have debug information in your final build of your game mm -hmm. so that you can better test it because you know just having the debug info often affects the performance of your game. Yep. <laughs> so it's like. Nah. We've had a thing where it's like our stat screen is like the most expensive thing to draw in our VFX system because mm -hmm. you know, copying all those individual little letters of text onto the screen. <laughs> right, yeah. Even today is actually you know, enough to affect your final game performance. Like, does it run at 60? Wait, turn off your debug. If it, yeah, it does. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like, I thought that was a, a clever way. It's like, yeah, just put some stuff on the dashboard so that uh, A, it makes the dashboard look alive and B, it gives us useful debugging information. It's like, yeah.
Yeah. Win win. Yeah. Do you have any else? Hey. Hmm. Could this be a trap? No, do, you, do, you, do you ever script guys so it's like they come attack you once you pick up the talisman or something? No, no. Although we did have a feature, uh, there's another item uh, that I remembered. Uh, we did have a feature that was implemented partially uh, but never actually used in the game and that is um, basically uh, floor triggers to open doors. Interesting. The idea being that you like you would walk into an intersection and then step on the on the uh, trigger pad in the middle of the intersection and then a bunch of doors would open and everybody would start coming after you. Ah, monster closet. Yeah. Uh, something Before like, there was actual monster closet. The trouble the trouble was I couldn't make well, I it. Do. Yeah. yeah, I couldn't make it work um, because sometimes the uh, floor pads would double trigger. It would open the door and then close it again in rapid succession, and I like worked it for several days and couldn't quite figure out why it was doing that. And so ultimately I said, no, this isn't really adding anything to the game. I'm not going to worry about it. So for all these wonderful features you had, you wanted to have, you didn't have time because the yeah, clock's ticking. Tick, yep, tick, yep, yep, yep. Ever, was there a talk of doing a Monster Manor sequel? An actual sequel, not... An to... actual sequel, not Killing Time? Yes. Um, I believe... You know, I don't know that there was. Um... I think, because when I when I came out of this, I was sufficiently burned out that I was kind of not interested in doing another game again. Certainly not on certainly not on the schedule that I had done this, and so there wasn't really any talk of uh, a sequel to, a sequel to this game directly. Hmm. Even like say a month or two down the road, and sort of like after the sales started coming, it's like, oh, okay. you know, I don't know, I don't actually know how well this yeah, sold, because like, I mean, I, I w the, they didn't share the sales figures with me. Yeah, yeah, I heard it made back its budget. Yeah, well, I'd hope so. I mean, it was, it's a relatively small team. It was a really good game, and mm -hmm. it was an early game. So even though there weren't that many 3DOs out there in the world, this still was like a must-have title. You know, what are you mm -hmm. going to buy? A Bird's Life. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Because oh, there was there was a really you know this was probably the premier game for a very long time because I mean I remember I remember the first few games that were out was like um, Stellar Seven, Draxon's Revenge featuring Michael Dorn they probably blew most of their budget on getting him to do the voiceover. Mm -hmm. um, okay, there was that I think Mad Dog McCree was one of the earlier ones too with the gun. Oh, great, back into a corner. Again. And there was like Dragon. So Cra Crash and Burn was a pack and everybody had that. There you go. And then I want, to say, I want to say like Dragon's Lair was also early in there too. This was like the first like really hardcore game. I mean, Solar Seven was a little bit, but it was it was sort of like an up res, you know, mm -hmm. port of the, the old PC game, which was you know a souped up battle zone, not something that really ah oh, no. <laughs> you and your yeah, right, right. no 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 quarters there. No, okay. So any more any more gun power to be had? Really tempting fate here, dude. No, there's no I cleaned this area out. Okay. There's, there's another thing that I just I don't like areas that spawn, so when I designed it I said no, we're not there's not gonna be such a thing as monster random monster spawning. When you oh. clean out an area, it's clean. Which yes, still debate still goes on today and most people come down to the side of like, let's just not have an infinite spawn. It's just not fun. Mm -hmm. Unless it makes sense. <laughs> oh, it makes sense. So well, it'll feel like a vent or something. Yeah, like, you know, yeah. yeah, except you have to. You kind of have to. In, I've never played um, uh, a Doom 2000 or whatever it was, but basically you have to play that game walking backwards. Doom 2000. Yeah, the the Doom 3 or whatever. Doom the, 3, the one with the flashlight. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I don't, okay. I don't, oh well. No, I mean if you play it backwards, you're gonna get you'll get waylaid from behind. Uh, because well, that, there's a lot of stuff that, that spawns was, in front of you. Right. Um, well, my, my understanding was it's like you'd clean out a room, and then you'd walk into the next room, and then stuff from the previous room that you just cleaned out would come through and, and get you. And so you probably, basically, well, like, if you had to walk through every door backwards because you knew stuff was going to try and attack you from behind. Yeah, that's the problem with the monster closet thing, where it's uh, just like, I hit a random trigger, door mm -hmm. door opens that is to a one-by-one one space that apparently the monster has just been living in for the last ten years. <laughs> <laughs> with no food or water yeah. <laughs> We're waiting for you to come along and then open up and thankfully the architects put these wonderful sliding doors in there for no reason whatsoever 
<laughs> okay, so let's see what Les has to say here. By the way, you've never had nightmares of spiders, have you? Disgusting little creatures, but oh, so persistent. Watch your step. Even little things underfoot can be fatal. Well, that's not foreshadowing at all. No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Hang on. Let's see here. Okay. Ding. All right. Game has been saved. Yes. Well, Wait, did you save it? I with, think you saved it with no name. You let them save with no name. Um, hmm. maybe. Uh, I don't honestly remember. That would have been dumb, but it's possible we allowed that. Um, but yeah, no. So hang on. Let's just save to select a slot because you had two selected. Well, now you've overwritten your one game. So right. So that. Uh, you're playing. Um, anyway. Playing dangerous here. Well, I I would have suggested going on to the next map, except I died on this one. So we had so basically you got two maps for the for the price of one. Um, but um, how long have we been doing this? About forty five minutes, which okay. you know I don't I it, going over an hour is kind of uh, yeah pro probably good. not a thing. So we'll be covering uh, map number four next time. Thank you all very kindly for joining us.